In this Wrestle Talk news, a WWE star leaves for AEW. More details on the complete chaos at the Royal Rumble, Boss's son trying to win world championship, and more. Subscribe and enable notifications to always on for daily wrestling news videos. Do you hear that? It's the sound of freedom. Because today, every extra subscription to Wrestle Talk means a wrestler gets their wings. And a boy, Keith. And a boy. Support Wrestle Talk. Happy Free Agent Day, everybody! Because today, the 2nd of February, means that everyone released by WWE as part of the November 4th batch of firings is now free to work wherever they like. It's also Groundhog Day. While those released from NXT contracts in November were only subject to 30-day non-compete clauses and have been able to work elsewhere since early December, like Frankie Monet and Scarlett Bordeaux, French names, the main roster releases have only just had their 90-day term expired. Meaning the free agent well just got Karrion Cross, Ember Moon, Davy Boy Smith Jr., Oni Lorkin, Grand Metalik, Lince Dorado, Eva Marie, Nia Jax, and the power couple of Keith Lee and Mia Yim. Making them available to join AEW, Impact, New Japan, or to bankrupt your local indie fed imminently. It's also Groundhog Day. Nia Jax released her first post WWE shoot interview in an hour long podcast with Renee Paquette yesterday to mark the occasion, which you can find all about in Luke's bonus news video, including Jax claiming to have only injured two people, that she was fired by WWE for not being vaccinated, and that she very angrily turned them down when they wanted her for last Saturday's Women's Rumble match. But she also reiterated that she feels done with wrestling. So expect her in AEW by the end of the month, confirmed. Keith Lee, meanwhile, filed to trademark his limitless slogan last month, implying he will be returning to wrestling. And it just so happens to be AEW Dynamite tonight. It's also Groundhog Day. Karrion Cross, who has reverted to his much cooler pre-WWE name, Killer Cross, has directly teased their next move, posting on Instagram. Much on my mind as of late as I come to a close on this final period. In short, man. This was an incredible chapter of my life. Nothing but gratitude for every second. Thank you to everyone who came for the ride and thank you for letting me take you on one as well. 2020 to now has been a challenging period in human history. I hope I was able to cast some relief for people during these times. You all brought me to life every day and motivated me to find the best version of myself for you. As for the future, what you see next may disturb you, as I will not return in peace. Hashtag stay tuned, hashtag TikTok, with a black and white picture of him and his real life partner Bordeaux and a nice little heart emoji in the corner, somewhat softening the menacing disturb you threat. He followed that up with a short film posted to YouTube entitled Midnight, which reveals a huge wrestling return, a full head of hair on his head. If you train hard enough, kill a cross and die a proof, you can suddenly achieve immaculate hairlines. I remember the days when wrestlers would leave WWE, shoot a short film about escaping a prison, and then show up in AEW later that week. But since Malachi Black, that hasn't come to pass. With Buddy Murphy also putting out a promo video after he became a free agent, but he's still yet to turn up for another major promotion. Who do you think we'll see turn up on TV first out of the released batch of wrestlers? Let me know in the comments down below. Or I'll use my incredible wrestling brain. A mind honed by years of in-depth coverage by this industry to predict. Brian Kendrick versus John Moxley on tonight's episode of AEW Dynamite. Oh my god, what? That's been announced? I totally didn't know that already. I'm a proper Nostradamus me and you should totally subscribe. It was reported last month that Brian Kendrick had privately requested his release from WWE in December and was still waiting on the company's response. This news came out via Fightful just days after another former 205 Live wrestler, Mustafa Ali, had publicly requested his WWE release on Twitter. Since the pandemic, Kendrick had transitioned into a producer coach role for NXT and 205 Live, but presumably saw the multicolored writing on the wall with Vince McMahon's 2.0 rebrand. Fellow NXT coach Scotty Too Hotty quit 
shortly after the tonal shift, and WWE released a bunch of Triple H's carefully built backstage NXT team anyway, including the once thought untouchable William Regal. Kendrick did start a potential feud with Harland in mid-December, shooting an angle where he was thrown down a stairwell, and even announced a match for the NXT episode on the 28th, but that bout never happened. At the time, we all just dismissed that as a consequence of COVID, but it now appears to have been because of Kendrick's release request behind the scenes. Almost two months after he reportedly asked to be let go, Fightful Select gave an update last night that Kendrick had indeed now been granted his request, and he was no longer under contract. But before you could even say Spanky to AEW confirmed, AEW did it themselves. In his AEW debut, Brian Kendrick will face the toughest of tests tomorrow night on AEW Dynamite, when he goes one-on-one -on -one with former AEW World Champion John Moxley. John Moxley versus Brian Kendrick tomorrow night, live on Wednesday Night Dynamite. Presumably this will tie into Moxley's burgeoning feud with Brian Danielson, who started his career with Kendrick. There's no word on if Kendrick is officially hashtag All Elite with a contract in place, or if this is a one-off appearance. Along with Kendrick, Araya Davari also appeared for the promotion on last night's episode of Dark. He had previously wrestled on Rampage back in November. 205 Live to AEW confirmed. It's crazy, because according to rumors, both Kendrick and Davari were, at one point, scheduled to win the Men's Royal Rumble match, along with Shane McMahon, Seth Rollins, Riddle, Brock Lesnar, that guy in the green shirt who always sits in the front row, Corey Graves, Tamina, and Randy Orton. Maybe in an attempt to make up for how boring and predictable the actual men's rumble match was, numerous wrestling sites were reporting a bunch of conflicting plans over who was meant to win. Both WrestleVotes and PW Insider claimed Riddle was the front runner to win the match, but St. Louis hometown boy Randy Orton was also considered, but this was changed eventually to Lesnar. But other sites have refuted this, with Fightful Select reporting Brock was penciled in as the winner at least two weeks before the show. And Ringside News add that the Lashley vs. Lesnar finish, where Roman Reigns cost Brock the match, was designed with Lesnar later winning the Rumble in mind. Apparently, there were many finishes considered for the Men's Rumble, but they all involve Lesnar winning, because Roman vs. Brock is inevitable. Apparently Riddle ever being considered to win is not true. But Fightful did say they'd heard another name was going to win the match at one point who wasn't Brock. Probably Roman. At least a Women's Rumble match was really fun. Or was it? It's been reported that one reason the Men's Rumble felt so lacklustre was because Triple H, who usually oversees the fun creative spots, was not around to book the match, as he's still recovering from his serious cardiac event last August. Instead, Shane McMahon was given a much larger role in the booking, with his main idea reportedly being, include more Shane McMahon. Fightful Select is reporting the women's match suffered from a similar situation behind the scenes. Tyson Kidd is usually the head agent for WWE's women's division, acting as the producer for many of its great matches since the promotion decided equality was a thing they liked now. But Kidd has reportedly not been producing matches in WWE for several weeks now, and Fit Finley was brought in to oversee the women's rumble instead. We don't know why Tyson has not been backstage as of late, but his absence was reportedly felt considerably behind the scenes. As the wrestlers who actually wrestled in the match called it complete chaos and a mess with low morale after they rehearsed it the night before. Apparently, at least one star passed on wrestling in the match when they found out Kid wasn't producing it. It's come out that both Alexa Bliss and Asuka were meant to make their returns in the women's matches too, but they were both scrapped. No reason has come out for why Bliss didn't enter, but Fightful right WWE didn't feel Asuka was physically ready to return. So Asuka wasn't ready for Asuka. Oksana and Jillian Hall were also backstage as possible alternates in case anyone couldn't compete on the day. And the men's rumble could have been even more mid, as their big backup stars were reportedly Apollo Crews, Shelton Benjamin, Cedric Alexander, and R-Truth. Which is extra painful, as it's rumoured they were all also scheduled to win the match at one point or another. The real winner should have been Shane McMahon says Shane McMahon. As hot off the heels of reports he has significant backstage heat because he tried to book the Rumble match around building a feud between him and Seth Rollins, a new report has come out that he's scrambling to get himself another big match 
for WrestleMania 38. Ringside News claims McMahon vs Bobby Lashley was an idea floated around before day one, but the idea was switched to something else. Shane was also meant to be at this week's Raw, where he would have become one of the entrants into the Elimination Chamber, but Vince McMahon himself replaced Shane with his new favourite son, Austin Theory. There's no word why Shane wasn't at the show or why the plans changed, but his behaviour was described as argumentative backstage at the Rumble show. Bobby Lashley vs Shane McMahon to decide the wettest wrestler in the world has unfortunately been dropped though, and WWE is now working on something else for both men. Just because we never properly announced the winner of me vs Adam Blompier in our twice in a lifetime Fantasy Booking Warfare special, Adam won with 64% of the vote, despite not actually booking The Rock vs John Cena like he was meant to. I did. I hope you lose at WrestleJamia, Adam. Here's Tempest with his review of last night's NXT in about five minutes. See, so first you play Sangha of the Thunder, and then you combine it with Suijin and Kazijin, and then you can create the Gate Guardian, and Kane was the Gate Guardian in Extreme Rules 2015, where he had to guard the gate of the Steel Cage match. What's going on, WrestleTalk friends and fans? Tempest is back with another review of NXT 2.0 in about five minutes. So this show started with a big six-man tag team match as Imperium took on the Diamond Mine. The work in this opening match was very good. These two teams have very similar styles and it meshed very well. The Creed Brothers continue to show that they've got a lot of potential and Roddy Strong is Roddy Strong and he's gonna be one of the best workers on any roster he's on. Imperium is getting a new push so Walter was able to hit a big powerbomb and get the win. That's right, I said Walter. This was a really solid opening match and a really fun way to open up the show. This gets a four out of five. We then got an in-ring promo from Toxic Attraction as Gigi Dolan and Casey Jane called out Indy Hartwell and Persia Parada and set up their NXT Women's Tag Team Championship match for NXT Vengeance Day. But the real meat and potatoes of this promo came when Kaylee Ray came out to the ring to confront Mandy Rose. Mandy Rose continued her usual stick of being just so sexy, but Kaylee Ray knocked this promo out of the park, saying that none of the things that make Mandy Rose special make her a champion, and said that she was champion for 600 and however many days while Mandy Rose was sucking face with Otis and falling on her ass at WrestleMania. Every once in a while, one of these promos feels a lot more real than the others, and it really helps get Get you invested in a story like this. Mandy Rose denied Kaylee Ray a title shot, but Kaylee Ray said that by the end of the show she would have it, and sure enough, she did. Thanks to some illegal wrestling activity. Throughout the rest of the show, Kaylee Ray harassed Mandy Rose, first by stealing her van with the rest of Toxic Attraction involved. That's Grand Theft Auto. That's kidnapping. That's a felony. But she later just returned the van, and the rest of Toxic Attraction were never seen again, which was a little bit odd. And then you saw Kaylee Ray chasing Mandy Rose through the backstage area as Malik Blade and Idris Sanofe had a very inappropriate conversation. You had the worst use of cake ever in wrestling, and then Mandy Rose slipped and fell down about 12 times on the way to the ring after the main event was over and finally gave Kaylee Ray her title shot. This promo felt very real and was very intriguing and was very good and gets a 4 out of 5. The rest of the things on this show, I'm not going to bother rating because it's all backstage nonsense, but they really tried to undo all the work this promo had done to make this rivalry feel real. Next up, we saw Raquel Gonzalez beat Cora J. Cora Jade was able to get some offense in this match, but this was a pretty dominant performance from Raquel Gonzalez, as you would kind of expect it to be. And then after the match, Raquel just changed her mind for no reason and said, let's go win the Dusty Cup. Why did she do that? See, some of the stories WWE write aren't bad on paper, like Cora Jade winning over Raquel Gonzalez and them competing in the Dusty Cup isn't a bad story in theory, but in execution, there's nothing about this rivalry or these matches so far that would lead you to believe that Raquel Gonzalez would ever change her motivations or her feelings towards Cora Jade. It's like they said that Cora Jade wins over Raquel Gonzalez through her performance, but none of the actual performance tells that story. The match itself was fine, just kind of unremarkable. It gets a 2 out of 5. We then had the return of Saray as she took on Kayla Inlay. Saray's new character is kind of confusing. Her magic necklace started glowing backstage and then when she came out she was dressed the way she used to be. Didn't have her pigtails or her glasses and that's a big thumbs up but she's got a bit of a dyed hair job now. We'll see where the character ends up going but for this match she had a very dominant performance against Kayla Inlay and hit a big sun ray suplex for the win. Again not a whole lot to it. Gets a 2 out of 5. Next up we had another in-ring promo this time from Carmelo Hayes, Trick Williams, and Cameron Grimes. Cameron Grimes is making 
making a bunch of jokes about SpongeBob and hey, I'm a 25 year old. I'm your target audience for such humor, but this didn't make me want to see their match more. The two will face off for the title at NXT Vengeance Day and that match probably will steal the show. I'm very much looking forward to it. And this promo segment was okay. It wasn't great, but it was okay. Gets a three out of five. Next up, we had LA Knight taking on Joe Gacy. Knight and Gacy were able to have some solid spots, but nothing in this match mattered until Grayson Waller got involved, hitting a really nice little rolling stunner, hopping over the barricade to take out LA Knight. LA Knight was able to just beat the 10 count to get back in the ring, but Joe Gacy was able to hit his finish for the win. After the match, Grayson Waller cut a promo saying that if LA Knight is able to beat Sangha of the Thunder next week, he might remove the restraining order. That's not how restraining orders work. I don't think you can leave a man unconscious and cut a promo over his prone body and still have a restraining order against him. Let me check. You can't do it. This was fine. This gets a three out of five. Next up, we had another fairly short match as Amari Miller took on Wendy Chu. Amari Miller was given Tiffany Stratton's credit card ahead of this match, with Stratton saying that if Amari Miller was able to beat Wendy Chu, she would be taken on a shopping spree courtesy of her daddy. Your enjoyment of this match will really kind of depend on how you feel about Wendy Chu. Her gimmick can be kind of fun, and she is able to integrate her offense into working with the gimmick fairly well, but... I don't know, it just doesn't really do it for me. If I'm watching things in a vacuum, just bell to bell, the work is pretty good, and Wendy Chu is a capable wrestler, in case you were not aware, Karen Q can go. That being said, I just don't really see myself getting into this feud between comedy character Sleeping Girl and comedy character Daddy's Princess. So Wendy Chu was able to beat Amare Miller with a roll up, and then after the match, Tiffany Stratton asked for her credit card back, only for Wendy Chu to reveal that she had pickpocketed Amare Miller during the match. That's more illegal wrestling activity. Just a little bit of theft, just a little bit of illegal wrestling activity, just a little bit. Again, I didn't get that much out of this match and it really wasn't long enough to be anything more than average. It gets a two out of five. Next we had Andre Chase taking on the debuting Draco Anthony. There had been video promos for Draco Anthony hyping up his debut as a former Marine and then he went out and lost to Andre Chase in a few minutes. Don't understand this show. Andre Chase's character is still like a worse version of the Timothy Thatcher character or a worse version of a Drew Gulak character. All around this gimmick just doesn't feel natural because it doesn't feel real. He's still out there in his goddamn university sweater and Andre Chase never wins. So when he goes out there and beats the debuting Draco Anthony, that doesn't make me very excited to see Draco Anthony again. There were a lot of really nothing matches on this show and this was definitely one of them. This gets a two out of five. But then we had what I thought was a very good main event as Braun Breaker and Tommaso Ciampa took on Legado Del Fantasma's Raul Mendoza and Joaquin Wilde. It's really weird to see that WWE is capable of booking a baby face champion properly because they've been doing a very good job with Braun Breaker so far. Braun Breaker and Tommaso Ciampa did feel like the two biggest stars on this show, which they basically are at this point. And they had a really good match with Legato Del Fantasma with a really solid finish with Tommaso Ciampa pushing one of them through the announce table off the top rope while Braun Breaker hit his press power slam for the win. I thought this was about as good a main event as I've seen on NXT 2.0. This gets a five out of five. This was a very fun way to close the show that had been pretty uneventful up to this point. So overall, it's tough because there were a few really good things on this show like the main event and the opening match but the middle of this show was just so average even with the really fun opening match and main event i can't give this show more than a three out of five so i'm not gonna it gets a three out of five and that just about wraps it up for me if you want to hear more of my thoughts on this week's show make sure you go over to wrestle talk podcast later on today when myself and chopper pete will be breaking down the entire show in complete detail until then he's won the jam that championship back because liw for life some may have never been in the right place at the right time. Others were a victim of booking malpractice and managerial negligence. But the one thing the following 10 variants have in common is they should all have won the WWE Royal Rumble. Let's get ready to clean up the sacred timeline! Sorry to steal your bit, Adam.